apologize for the network glitches. Um, so, Tammy, I was saying that um, with all the protests that happened with um, the NSAS protests, we saw the Nigerian youth come together with one voice to dis I mean, to fight a cause. And we are seeing that that power in the unity, you know, can actually mm. transform, you know, or head us towards the new Nigeria that we're hoping for. So because we've lost a lot of time and we have guests waiting for us, I'll just call up on um, um, Mustafa first. Um, uh, Mustafa will just share a bit of um, what he understands with Nigeria, a bit of background, Nigeria and her history. Then um, Chris, um, Phillips will also pick up from where Mustafa stopped. Mustafa, are you there? Thank, Thank you. you so much for joining us. Yes, and thank you so much for having me. Um, so basically, being um, talking about Nigeria and our history, most times we start from 1914, which is when there was the amalgamation between the um, Southern and Northern Protectorates. And before then, we have been seeing Nigeria living in different, um, let's say, tribes or nations, let's put it our way, nation states, um, before the arrival of the British. And from then to um, 1960, when we get our independence, the British themselves actually were aware that we were a society or a country that was with um, diverse um, people and we had different cultures. So in bringing them together, I think one of their major fears, and they actually have this documented anyway, one of their major fears was the fact that these guys from the Northern uh, Protectorate, formerly Northern Protectorate, the Northern region, and those from the Southern Protectorate, which became the Western, Eastern, and Mid, uh, Mid, East, uh, Mid, uh, Midwest region, you have different cultures, you have different ways, you have different um, traditions and values. So making sure that there is that unity, like you mentioned, was like one of the major fears they had. And if you read the history books going towards like our independence, there was always this uh, mistrust. So people from different parts of the country do not tend to trust each other because they come from the paper down. However, we've been blaming the military for a long time, but and when you look at what's going on in Nigeria, I think that's 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 what's quite a lot of commentators and what you tend to get, where in after the military coup in 1960, the first military coup in 1966, what it destroyed was regionalism. And that regionalism was something whereby each region was growing at its own pace. And there was not so much power at the center. And because of that, the sense of nationhood was, yes, there's Nigeria, but you felt a sense of nationhood with your region. After the military took over, there has been so much interruption that we either blame colonialism from 1960 or we blame military rule. And if I fast forward to 1999 to 2019, let's last about 20 years, we've been able to govern ourselves for like 20 years. So it starts, it starts to ask the question, like, is it really about blaming the past or taking ownership of our responsibilities? And we are trying to link it to what you, your introduction was basically is, between 1999 and 2019, you have children who were born within that age or within that period. And basically, they grow up in a society where there is a lot of cultural um, influence from the mobile phone itself, social media, and all of that. So what you have is you can't really hold, yes, the past is there, but you can't really hold on to those structures in leading us to the future. You have to understand that things are changing. The demography of Nigeria is actually much towards the youth. I was reading recently whereby like about um, 44% of the country's population is from zero to, eight, four to, zero to 15 years old. And that's very, very alarming because you now start wondering like, what are we planning for? So in terms of nationhood and um, unity and trying to link it back to what's part of all this conversation, I feel it's more about most of what the older generation held on to can no longer be used today. Um, you can't really divide someone who is probably chatting with someone in US or Kenya or where so they really does feel like we are much interconnected than those division of oh you're also you are Igbo, you are all of this. So I feel that's where looking from our history, those divide and road tactics that have been working for so long, it seems it's quite obvious now that they no longer like have that kind of power they had in the past before. Okay. Absolutely. Thank okay. you. So you call on, um Ibikule Phillips, just to give your own um, introduction, then before the ladies come in to ask their questions. Ibikule, you there. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Um, well, most of us have done a fantastic job of outlining the history from 1914. Uh, because what it is, nobody who's wise will argue that unity has been elusive for the entity called Nigeria. 
and there's a reason why. It's because they've taken out meritocracy. The British left behind something they know was going to destroy meritocracy. But also, most of us talked on it that we can't keep giving ourselves the excuse that the past put us in a trap. After 60 years, we should have figured out how to wriggle out of that trap. But um, unity is a thing that if you are focused on the job, nation building is is a mission. It's not a day's job. It's something that has to be deliberately done. So maybe I won't bother looking at the problems again because I was even going to tell most of us that if we look before 1914, there were things happening because the British went around defeating one over after the other. There was something they called gunboat diplomacy. 1903, they seized the Sultan's capture. <laughs> the scepter of the soldier was going to 1903. 1860, they took Kosoko, you know, with their gunboat diplomacy. They were taking things. So the thing was a business. The thing we are calling Nigeria was a business. Before 1914, somebody paid 893,000 pounds to buy the business from the Royal Niger Company. <laughs> Until now, they haven't let go of the business. They just have their proxies who are running the thing. And that's why it's a mess. What most people don't realize is that a bunch of military adventurers seized power in 1966. There were two coups in 1966. I'm not talking about the first one with Kadnan Zugu. I'm talking about the second one in July. And those people since then till now, they've been taking it in turns to run the country. The only person who has joined them since that 1966 that was not part of them in 66 was Gulag Jonathan. So going forward, the first thing we need to do is number one job. That thing we're calling a constitution is rubbish. It's not we the people. It won't take us anywhere. I'll go straight to the exclusive list. They put about 5,500 things for one man to do. It's impossible. You can't even generate electricity, even if you mean well. If I come now with my company and I say, look, we can put lights in Lagos nonstop, 24-7. It's a lie. The exclusive list says I must put my electricity that is my own. I must put it on the national grid. So there's things that we're using to hinder ourselves. The same exclusive list, it removes responsibility from this government or any other government. They have zero responsibility to you. All they do is harness the business. It continues as a business. The thing that happens in NMPC, the thing that happens at the Ports Authority, MPA. So those are the three big money makers: MPA, the Customs Service, NMPC. Once they've captured those ones, that's it. Every other thing is just how to share it. So to move forward, the first thing we have to remove is this nonsense about state quota. The, the thing has to have a limit. And after 60 years, it's time to end it. Let everything be done on merit now. When I was 11, I did common entrance. Believe it or not, my score, because we had rankings in King's College, <laughs> my score was number eight, the eighth highest score in the whole of KC. You know, I still had to use leg to get into KC. They bounced me far to Ijaniki. They thought I should be happy to be in Ijaniki. I got the eighth highest score. Let me say it again. I got the eighth highest score <laughs> in the country. And I still didn't get my first choice of uh, 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 college that I wanted to go to. So let's not focus on my own experience. Let's just say the business of zero meritocracy hasn't worked for anybody. What we okay. need now is if you are the best person for the job, by all means, let's give the job to you. Don't give it to me because I'm speaking your language. Don't give it to Mr. Mustafa because, oh, you know his father. We don't want tribalism. We don't want nepotism. We just want a meritocracy. So going forward, the time is short. That's all right, so end let me... that thing. That thing we're calling okay, 1999 let... Constitution. Yeah. End it. Okay, let me call on uh, Lamy. Then Tammy would ask a question. Lamy, go ahead, please. Okay, um, thank you, Ibekunle, for your contribution. Now, um, what my question is, is you were trying to talk about the federal character. You want mm -hmm. it included from the Constitution. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you're you thinking that uh, merit is being sacrificed on the altar of um, federal character. Yes. That also has its problem. But the way out for me, this is my personal view, and I want you to comment on this. Mm. If we at the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, mm -hmm. you would see that there are basically four countries operating as one. Mm -hmm. Have their devolved parliamentary. They all have their system of system of government. They have their educational system. They have everything individually working for them. 
A Welshman will not call himself an Englishman. An Englishman will take offense if you call him a Scotsman. They understand that they have their culture. They did not leave their language. They still speak Welsh. If you go to Welsh and Wales, Welsh. The Northern Ireland speak Ireland. They, though they don't spend the same money, they carry the same passport. But they still retained their heritage. They still he retained their culture. So take it from this, and these are the imperialists that lumped us together in Nigeria, because as far as I'm concerned, we are an accident. Nigeria happened by accident. Now, taking a cue from the United Kingdom, don't you think going back to regionalism would work for us? Let every young work at Let's have you, you've nailed it already. There's nothing to answer. You've nailed it already. We you, they didn't take away their identities. A Welshman, like you said, is first of all a Welshman. The same way an Igbo man is first of all an Igbo man before he thinks of Nigeria. Yes. You've nailed it. In America, they have more diversity. In Nigeria, we have 250 languages and we think we are doing something. We can't Listen, more. plus all our 250 languages, Nigerians are in the US. They are doing well. Plus all their whatever number of languages they have in UK. People are in the U.S. Like America has more diversity because everybody from every other nation is in America and they're doing well. Why? Because it's a meritocracy. If you are the best man for the job, they don't care where you're from. Just come in, do a good job. We'll hail you. We'll give you national honors. So look at what happened in 2015. In 2015, some people got together and rebranded. And this is the thing. People have to pay attention. Everything that happens in front of everybody People forget. They have short memories. This person who was being rebranded in 2015, his record was clear. He had not even been head of state. He wasn't hidden in a box. He had been head of state before. The same people that brought him removed him. They now brought him and rebranded him. And in front of everybody, they rebranded him. They said, no, this is the answer. We need change. We need change. Some people were shouting, we need change. They brought lies. The previous man, they said he did this and this and that and the other. Today, now, it took some people five years to discover that we are fooling ourselves. Somebody that has no capacity. <laughs> Somebody Let that me cannot... Tell me, are you there? So we can... Yes, I up am. Okay. So, to move stuff on now. Now, I've heard different sides of this story. Some people, for example, have clamored for, for are clamoring for restructuring, and they're saying that that's the way forward. Just like uh, I believe Ibikule shares this thought that will be based on what you said. Some people are clamoring for restructuring. They say, let's go back to giving power to these regions and let the center, you know, let the center would be weaker than the regions. That's what will eventually happen if we do that. And then the center, the regions will be able to take care of themselves. However, another point of view is that this may lead to national disintegration at the end of the day, because at some point the center becomes too weak and we, we are thinking to ourselves at some point, why are we together again? Maybe we should just go our separate ways. So that's the fear of some people. Now, what I'd like you to do now is to comment on the positives and negatives of restructuring. So the people who are listening, you know, get different thoughts about this. Are there positives? Are there negatives? I'd like to hear from you. Okay, so there's basically no system that has no positive or negative. So just the way, even the military, as much as it's condemned, they did some things that were good. Even the colonialist um, um, form of um, the colonialism itself, they actually had some, what was it called, some positive sides to it. But basically, in looking at regionalism itself, it's taking us back to our history and saying, okay, during this period, were there some benefits compared to when we were using the regional system of governments? And if you look at it back then, or because I wasn't alive there anyway, but if you go mm -hmm. back to the development that happened by during that time, what you see is where each region is actually very competitive and they are growing at their own pace. And there's a reason for that. Like the last commentary before this question was basically like you are speaking about the Irish or the Americans or the or United Kingdom. Basically, the thing there is this: you need you talk about your history, you talk about your sense of um, culture, and where 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 is your allegiance to? If you do, if you feel it's very much towards the center. It's almost like a long, uh, let's say, like a long vault. So basically, you want something that is actually closer to you. And if I bring that back even into this particular system of government we are running, this system of government we are running, we actually copied it from the United States. And you just look at it today, and I get a shiver when I see some of these things. You see a governor performing the duty or the role of a local government chairman. And because most of us are not aware, we are just like, oh, we clap for him. So there's the power already there, but it's not actually devolved to 
the lower what's it called the lower um, level itself. So regionalism for me remains whereby it's quite a lot where you are trying to put too much of issues on one man's um, what's it called head. Let's put it that way. One woman in case it's the president anyway. But basically trying to see where can I delegate some of these um, roles and power so that this person can actually pay more attention to what's going on. And from the, even the process, is, process itself actually shows whereby if you actually understand the way your people are, you, you would not want to shoot your neighbor. Because if you are a policeman or a policewoman who comes from a particular community, I, I'm very sure you would, be, you would, you would hold that sense of um, communism, like, okay, this person is someone I know very well. So irrespective of our fears, going back to your question, whereby Restructuring for this restructuring itself, it has already become like a broken record because I think since 1999, there has always been like different. Um, I think the last one was held during the last um, president's um, time. But I think there's always usually one consensus. And when we talk about restructuring, there's one thing there whereby it's always like a top down approach. And it's almost still what I mentioned earlier why we are not really involved, um, involving those who need to be involved. We, are, we seem to be deciding for the future where we might not be in. And those people who actually should be in that future, they are not given what to participate in. So we, um, for each um, system, like I mentioned earlier, you have your merits, you have your demerits. But the most important thing is to actually try and see what the focus is for and try and make it work within it. Because even the one we have today, we are actually not making it work. So we are like, okay, can we try something else? Because it's already, already 20 years and we seem to realize that from 20 years, perhaps the greatest lesson we have learned is the fact that there's too much power at the center. And we are like, okay, can we actually try some? Because, for instance, part of this um, regionalism or some of this talk actually has been um, community policing. We complain and say, oh, there's too much power, you give it to a state governor. However, there's also too much power given to the president. So, well, give or take, whether you like it, there will always be this positive side to something or negative side to something. Each system can actually be abused. But if we hold these people who are accountable to us, if we hold them responsible for their actions, I believe we can make all of these systems work. Okay. All right. So okay. I was going to ask. Oh, tell me, you want, you want to come in, Temi? Go ahead. No, no, no. I just, um, I was just going to summarize what you said, but you're here, so that's fine. Go ahead. Okay. So I was just going to say that you're looking at it as unity in diversity and the fact that um, it needs not be as it has always been. I mean, you mentioned that it's been a lot of years down the line. And I was going to have a follow-up question. Oh, may I go ahead? Sure, please, go ahead. So what, what would you say is the way forward now? I mean, there's been a lot of clamoring. There's been a lot of talking about this thing for some time now. What would you say is the way forward? And is it going to be like some, for example, what you mentioned, saying that, oh, it's been like this for some time. Let's try something. It looks, um, it sounds... Maybe it sounds a little bit experimental. Let's try something else. Let's just let's do something else. Would you say that um, this is something that, like from perhaps other states, other countries, you say that this is something that we've seen work and we'll be able to imbibe it? And if you have those examples, I'd like to give us because it sounded a little bit like let's experiment with this. And I'll say that what steps would you say? Because you mentioned that some people should be involved, and that was talking about inclusion. And I would like to say, what are the practical steps that you're suggesting? I'm hoping that we are speaking to people who have some power, not just not just every not just um, the young people, but uh, everyone who has some power who's listening. So, what would you say is the way forward? I would just like to ask you. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so when, you, when so I some say practical steps. Okay, so when I say experimenting, it's actually not even like trying a system that you've actually you know had uh, a previous experience with before. So we've mentioned um, between 1960 to 1966, or 1963, basically, when we had the first public, basically. So it's not something that we've, we've not had an idea or we didn't have, because if you look at the history of Nigeria before the independence, the southern region was actually very, not the southern, um, the western and eastern region, they were ready for independence. The northern region wasn't ready for independence. They said, oh, give us some time, and we need to be sure that, okay, we could be responsible for these roles, and um, we could be at the pace of the southern region. So you, you could see that we actually had some history um, of, uh, what was it called, going at your own pace before. And okay. if you look, most times when you talk about Nigeria, you look at the um, information and most times you see where if someone gives you a, an information about Nigeria, for instance, you look at the poverty level in Nigeria and you start 
going through it. You start realizing where there is some need for attention in some particular areas of the country. And because of that, because we've been, let's say, lumped into one, it doesn't give this focus on can, if, if the president or whoever is in charge there focuses on one particular area, it will seem as, it will seem as, oh, you're only helping this, your region or this particular region of the country. If it focuses on another area, there will always be this clamor of marginalization and all of that. So there is always too much responsibility on that particular um, figure. However, um, to your question where you say, what are the practical um, steps? I, I, I feel most of what we do, we do a lot of, um, I, I like, um, it's more or less like a talk shop. So you are very much interested in setting up panels, having discussions that does, we are actually talking this way and we don't take any action. And for a very long time, what we are saying is that if we do not take decisive action, what we keep on doing is we would let this, um, there would be this um, tick that would just... Um, so let me be... Can I come to Ibi Kunle, uh, Mustafa? Just hold that thought a bit because I would like to hear Ibi Kunle's um, take on this um, comment that I'm about to make. Do we really need unity to building a new Nigeria? Do we need to be united as one to building an, or to birthing a new Nigeria? Ibi Kunle, are you there? Oh, I, 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 I'm not sure I understand how you framed the question because, of course, with this unity, you're not going to go anywhere. But that's why we've been going around in circles for 60 years. So as, as, as we are today as a structured Nigeria, you know, because mm. some people are saying we want to be on our own. We want to, do we really, I mean, do, because I, I think the question that Tammy was asking about, tell, telling us what are the pros, what are the cons, you know, maybe if people will see the larger picture as to what unity can achieve for us as a country, if we decide to say uh, we want to come together, if the answer is yes, then what are the, what are the things, the structures that we need to put in place now? Because I hear what Mustafa is saying. He's talking about, you know, not talk shops and all, which is what we've seen in the past. Even when they did the, when they did the, the what's it called for uh, President, President Jonathan, um, they put together the, um, I, 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 I'm losing my thoughts now, the, um, the documents, you know, that was supposed to help restructure the constitution in 19, what was, what was uh, the one again? 2014 confirmed. It was not implemented. Uh -huh. You know? So let me... <laughs> uh, you see, we like to deceive ourselves. If we continue without restructuring, the only thing that will happen is that one strong man from every region will come, snatch the baton, run his own direction. You see how what is happening now is we haven't finished Lagos Ibadan Railway. Somebody said they want to build from Gibia to Maradi, passing Daura to inside Niger. Uh, the volume of business, I can tell you straight up, in Niger Republic, their entire gross domestic product is $12 billion. Their entire budget for 2019 is $2 billion. You now want to take $1.9 billion to go and build a rail line. Is it for you to bring people to be rigging election? Okay, let's be positive. They say moving forward. I don't want to get angry here. To move forward positively, I've thought about it and I put two things as priority. The first thing is, in Nigeria, we keep saying get your PVC as if it's who voted. It's not who voted, it's who is counting the vote. What happened in 2019 is that the president went to go and bring his niece. Amina Zakari is the daughter of the ML Kazari. The ML Kazari raised General Buhari when he was four and his parents had died, when he became an orphan. So I don't know how I can go and bring my niece to count my votes and she won't make me win. So it's not who is voting, it's who is counting the vote. So the first thing we need to do, make everybody's vote count. Let's hear the voices. What are the people saying, whether rightly or wrongly? Wherever you are, let your vote count. If you are in Maiduguri, if you are in uh, Zamfara, if you are anywhere you like, if you are in Aba, once you vote, immediately the things will go to where there's no middleman. We don't want any collation center. I mean, as a guy, was manning the collation center. I hope I'm not, you know, you people, people get afraid in Nigeria, you know. So I, maybe I shouldn't be talking like this, you know. But that's number one. Let votes count. It's simple. There's blockchain, there's all sorts of technology. That's the, the second thing, that thing we're calling constitution, we keep referring to constitution, is because of this constitution, that's why they will now come, they say they are doing a panel of inquiry. As if drones didn't already record what happened. God has caught them this time around. That place in Lekki, there was, army had no business in that place. Why? Because there was nobody disrupting the peace. For army to show up is because the police commissioner and all the policemen in Lagos would have said, we've tried to keep the peace. We have failed. 
governor, you have to call him the army. When the army come, if and when the army come, it's not that they immediately become the enemies of Nigerian citizens. No. The army, they are supposed to do three things. Number one, clear an escape route for whoever they are dispersing. Number two, draw a line and say, army is here now. We stop playing games with you people. Anybody that crosses this line, you are inviting gunshot. Number three, there's a diarist. That diarist is there for a reason. It's counting every bullet. The next morning, when the army wake up, they must go and account for every bullet that they use. So, none of this was present in Lekki. I don't know about the other places where there were problems. Maybe they needed army there. But not in Lekki. Lekki, people were sitting down waving Nigerian flags. And this is the idiotic thing about, you know, what's going on in Nigeria. Somebody just came up with a text, said, oh, my uncle, my father, my grandfather is a general or is a brigadier. He told me that if you are waving green flag. Wait, who said that? There's no such thing. It's nonsense. And people have to pay with their lives to discover that we were lying to each other. Somebody, and then people were spreading that tweet. That day, I wanted to cry that day. I was watching that thing, DJ Switch and God Team 45. They were showing it live on Instagram. They were telling them, sit okay. down, sit down. This shooting had already started. They said, sit down, sit down, sit down. People actually sat down. They were waving their flags until they started seeing blood. Look, two things. Number one, let votes count. Whoever you are, wherever you are. Number two, reform the constitution. We can't move forward without restructuring. Let everybody develop at their own pace. If some people want to sit down and be reciting verses in other languages, whether it's in, I don't want to be, you know, they should sit down and be doing that. If that's a skill, while the world is coding, 11-year-old children are coding, they're writing code in Japan. We are here. Some people are reciting verses in a language that nobody even speaks in Nigeria. Okay, if that's how they want to proceed, they should yeah. continue. Okay, but let me we, tell Lamy. We should, everybody Lamy, should can you quickly proceed at their own pace. Okay. Um, <laughs> my question is, yes, I understand that we have to restructure. Uh, there's a lot of um, pullbacks in the constitution. I've always advocated for that. I think there should be an entirely new constitution. Yes. But Oh, hold on, hold on. Even if we now have an entirely new document, don't you think that human development, human capacity development should precede this? Because people's views about development in Nigeria is different. And this is colored by their ethnic and religious uh, colorations. So if we're saying we should throw it away, votes should count. Don't forget, people, the vote of an illiterate is the vote of a literate person. So I think that we should focus more on human development. What do you think about it? I agree. I agree. I agree. I agree. One minute, and if one minute, because we ran out of time. One minute. Yeah, well, again, there's not much to add to that, what you have said. Human development is important. Look what's happened now. As far as the intelligent people who are buying raincoats, umbrellas, pizza, food, <laughs> as far as the intelligent people were cleared out of the scene, look at what the ones that were not educated. Look at what they started doing. They don't know any other way. They just know that blood was shed and somebody has to pay. That's it. I saw photographs of Bode Thomas. There's no shop in Bode Thomas. They didn't look. Human development has to be on the forefront, but that is going to take a while. Somebody has to sit down and say, what are our values as a country? That What are we teaching our children? So History don't has to be included. Don't it, will take time. It, will, it will take time, but it's very important. It's, it's job one. If we had time, is job one. But we've gone around in circles for 60 years. I think in the next 10 years, before Nigeria is 70, we need to get... We, everybody. Once you see a smart person talking, you know that this person is smart. Once you see an expert, experts everywhere in Nigeria, just bring the experts in. Let's do... Let's move forward. And then we'll start taking these people who we'll draw up an educational okay. plan. Human development is important. Okay, so Mustafa, one minute, please. <laughs> okay, so basically... um. I think most of what we have done, um, our assets uh, is our, our, what's it called? Our population is our assets. Yes. But unfortunately, what we've been doing so far is we've been misusing it. So it has become a liability, like a ticking time bomb, basically. And if we do not make sure, like what, what has been happening, or what most of the political class has been doing, they've been using poverty, they've been weaponizing poverty against us. And poverty is not just about food, but it's also about education, about um, how you think, and all of all those stuff. Because... Someone who has not eaten, all of this stuff we are talking about, they'll just be looking at it. What, what exactly are you talking about? So it doesn't make them think, it doesn't make them go, it doesn't make them ask questions. And for me, I think way forward, basically, is just like those of us who have the, will I say, the edge or the advantage or who are exposed enough need to start taking this practice step because you have to understand the structure. The structure is where some people want to 
hold on to that weapon whereby they cannot make you think because they are they are they are giving you some food food stock. The protest, for instance, for me, what it showed to me was like there was lack of political literacy or knowledge about the country itself. So at the end of the day, people just started picking up information from different places, and we cannot hold um, our leaders to 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 account. And the last point, because I heard that when recently was like. I think one of the major mistakes we always make is where we always say, let's wait to the next election. And I don't believe in that because basically, whoever you voted for is your personal business. But as long as someone has come in and said they want to come and serve you, you as a citizen, you are meant to hold that person responsible. So we don't need to wait to another election before we take over because if you don't have any country before that election, what are you going to do? So we always need to sensitize everyone to start asking questions. I think that asking question has been the highlight of all of this, whereby people are now demanding for what they want. It's not just about food. And once you do that, you start seeing that these leaders themselves, they start taking some steps that will probably be in the positive direction before the election itself. Okay, so we have one comment. Um, Tammy, are you there? You can quickly take the comment. Um, yes, I am. Okay, quickly take the comment so we can wrap up. Sorry, Uwa, I, I do not have the comment with me now. Sorry. I don't have the comment with me. The comment out. She said, good evening, Did you just I was for me? The day called Wazoka Day nowadays. Uh, from 19th, we are, we are having intertribal marriage with no objections from parents in most cases. This should be applied into governance. The end is a novel, typical example. That's from Ade in the UK. I think that's the only comment we can take because we really ran out of time. Um, we want to apologize again for the network glitches. Well, this, this technology and what comes with it. But thank you so much, Mustafa. And thank you so much, Ibikule, for joining us this evening. We're hoping to um, we're, we're hoping to have more of this conversation. So we will really, really be honored to have you back. Um, thank you, ladies. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you, Lami. Now, please watch a repeat broadcast of this episode thank tomorrow. You, 3 p.m. It's been a very insightful conversation and keep all the conversations going on all our social media platforms at Wayshow Africa or at Plus TV Africa as we continue to hear what you're saying. Now, in case you missed today's quote, let me find today's quote for you. Here it is again. Where there is unity, there's always victory. That's the quote for today. So we've all agreed that we actually want, we need to come together as a united country, but we must come together with new terms and conditions where we all know that we are all stakeholders into building a new Nigeria and everybody would benefit from it, not a lopsided kind of unity. Thank you again, ladies, for joining us. We'll see you live tomorrow at 8 p.m. as we bring another great conversation to your screen. Enjoy your evening.